Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Randy Stare? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll look at the background of Randy Stare. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Randy Stair was born in Pennsylvania on September 17, 1992. He worked in a supermarket called Weiss Markets in Eaton Township, Pennsylvania for about seven years. Randy was active on social media and started uploading videos in 2007. He started with short sketches and appeared in a few videos with other content creators. In 2014, he talked about a number of unfortunate events that occurred in his life, and he said he was changing directions. He created something he referred to as Ember's Ghost Squad. These were animated videos based on a series on Nickelodeon called Danny Phantom. Through video uploads, posts on Twitter, and other social media posts, Randy communicated information on a number of topics like his mood, his beliefs about crossing over into an animated world, and conducting a shooting. On June 8, 2017, Randy went to work at the supermarket. He was carrying a duffel bag containing two Mossberg 500 pump-action shotguns fitted with pistol grips. Around 11 p.m., when the store closed, he made his way to the back of the store and blocked an emergency exit. He then continued to work, which included cleaning and stocking shelves. At 12.10 a.m., he used Twitter to publish a number of links to files and videos related to the shooting he was planning on executing in a few minutes. He talked about how he had brought two shotguns in case one failed. Randy went to the back of the store and blocked the remaining exits, then went to the main entrance of the store and locked the automatic doors. At this point, he produced the two shotguns and started walking around the store. He had approached a woman named Kristen Newell, who was stocking shelves as she listened to music on her headphones. At that point, she did not see him because he was behind her, and she did not hear him because of the music. Randy stood next to her as she continued working. After about five seconds, she walked into the next aisle. Randy moved on. He continued through the store. He would shoot and kill three employees, two men, 63 and 47 years old, and one woman, 25 years old. Right after he shot one of the victims, he looked right at Kristen. They locked eyes. Kristen fled and hid in an area for employees, eventually escaping the store and calling 911. After committing the homicides, Randy went throughout the store shooting various objects, including merchandise, glass, and propane tanks, probably in an effort to create an explosion. He was unsuccessful. After walking to the deli area of the store, he used the shotgun to bring an end to his own life. During the attack, he had only used one of the two shotguns. He fired it 59 times. When the police arrived, they would find the victims and Randy dead. The autopsy revealed that he had taken quite a bit of Benadryl before his death. A search of Randy's home would reveal seven boxes of 12-gauge shotgun ammunition, drawings, cartoons, external hard drives, and other electronics. Before I get to the analysis, let's hear a word from today's sponsor, Felix Gray. Over the last few decades, people have really started spending a lot more time staring at screens. In this studio, I spend hours looking at three computer monitors, my laptop under the camera, not to mention my smartphone. In many ways, all these different screens have made our lives a lot more efficient. But as far as our eyes are concerned, the abundance of screens has also led to more eye strain. Five years ago, Felix Gray realized that blue light from screens is tough on eyes and disruptive to sleep. They designed glasses to make daily screen time more comfortable by using lenses that filter 15 times more blue light than regular glasses. The Carver style of Felix Gray glasses I'm wearing here are made from acetate and hand finished for a durable, lightweight frame that fits comfortably. These are available in prescription and non-prescription, mine of course are prescription, if you can feel your screen time and you're not sure if blue light glasses are right for you, start with the best in blue light. Try Felix Gray. They make glasses for the 21st century, which are designed for modern, hardworking eyes. With their 30-day money-back guarantee, there's nothing to lose except perhaps eye strain. Now moving to the analysis. 
What really stands out about this case is all the content that Randy produced before his crime. Here are some items featured in social media posts, including videos. These are some of the things he stated and believed. He talked about how he was depressed, which became particularly bad for him in 2013. He experienced a number of tragedies, which he believed explained his low mood, like when he totaled his car and two people close to him died that same year. He thought about his own death for years and did not imagine living past his 20s. He had been contemplating his demise for the last four and a half years. He had other emotions as well, including boredom, desire, fatigue, hatred, and anger. At one point, he started identifying as Andrew Blaze. So this was a character he made up and he assumed the identity. Randy had questions about his gender identity. He indicated that on Wednesday nights, when his parents went bowling, he would dress up as a woman. The autopsy report for Randy indicated he was wearing female garments under male clothing. He felt as though he was a female soul trapped in a man's body, and a girl inside of him was clawing to get out. He believed that after his death, he would cross over into the animated world he created and become an animated ghost girl. He thought that the animated girls in his series were real. They had lived and died on the planet Earth. He said that one of them was his eternal soulmate and talked to him all the time. He was destined to be with her until the end of time. So they were going to be together forever. I'm guessing that was his heaven and her hell. For most of his life, Randy didn't really feel like he fit in. He didn't know what his purpose was. He became stressed about developmental milestones like finding a job and graduating from high school. He had trouble with the loss of loved ones. He said he never had a girlfriend, although he was attracted to girls. He indicated he had no desire to be in relationships. He didn't like to socialize. He didn't like it when people acknowledged him. He wanted to be alone. At the same time, he wanted to be liked. He wanted friends. So we see kind of opposing forces here. Randy said that he despised the human race, developed a hatred toward all human beings, and wanted to kill as many people as possible. He felt as though it was senseless to try to make the world a better place because everybody would die at some point. Randy was fascinated with shootings of the mass type and had a particular interest in those involving schools. He wished he could have met the Columbine perpetrators. They were his heroes. They understood his pain. His homicidal fantasy appeared to be connected to his animated world. He talked about how no one could prevent him from killing and dying. It was his destiny. It was his true purpose. He had planned his crime for three to four months and documented everything in various recordings. He believed those items memorialized his legacy. He went to great lengths to make sure that everybody could view his recorded materials and learn from them. He said they deserved to be seen. Randy wanted people to continue working on his animated series, like creating animation for some of his scripts. He seemed to be upset that he had not achieved true fame with his videos. After his death, when he would become an animated ghost girl, he believed he would come back to the planet Earth as a ghost, but not on a daily basis, but rather would do subtle things on occasion for the people living on Earth. I guess like a casual and somewhat helpful ghost as opposed to a demon that would haunt people. He also thought there would be an eternal war across dimensions, and he wanted to train for that war. Based on Randy's behavior and his various statements, here are my thoughts about what was going on with him as far as mental health and personality. As far as mental disorders, other than a term on the autopsy report, we don't really see any information about Randy Stare. The autopsy stated that Randy suffered from gender dysphoria. This really seems like something the person who performed the autopsy would have heard from an outside source, rather than something they decided to put on themselves. Obviously, gender dysphoria is not revealed from examining a cadaver, unless the examiner made that determination solely from the fact that Randy was wearing women's garments. I'd be surprised if he did that, because that wouldn't necessarily indicate gender dysphoria. That could just be a preference that he had. Randy struggled as he contemplated his gender identity. He didn't quite have it figured out at the time of his death. It was an area that was challenging for him for a number of reasons, 
including his fears about not being accepted by family and friends. I think he believed he would find peace as far as his gender identity only by dying and going to this animated fantasy world. Randy stated that he was depressed. This is a central theme we see in his writings and in his videos. He lost his sense of purpose. He didn't take pleasure in activities. He was cut off socially. He felt like a failure with his video content, like he wanted to be more popular than he was. One theory says that Randy had depression with psychosis. When depression gets severe, psychosis is common. This theory is based on his statements that ghost girls were talking to him. It's possible he was psychotic, but other than his claims of hearing voices, there's no other evidence to support the psychosis theory. His claims that the ghost girls were communicating with him may have been more an extension of fantasy as opposed to literally hearing voices, like he felt they were communicating with him. He felt connected to them, almost like a maladaptive daydreaming situation. Looking at his personality with the five-factor model, we see he was high and openness to experience, very creative and invested in fantasy. He felt emotions intensely. He had low conscientiousness. He was impulsive, reckless, although at times he was productive. We see low extroversion. He was reserved, unfriendly, not outgoing. He did not like crowds. He didn't like to socialize. We see low agreeableness. He was antagonistic, not modest, and not altruistic. And we see high neuroticism. He was depressed, angry, anxious, and insecure. Randy appeared to be both narcissistic and psychopathic. He had a grandiose conceptualization of his own importance. When he talked about his videos, he acted like people would care about every detail, like they were witnessing something important in history, almost like he was a famous actor talking about filming a scene in a movie that was extremely popular. He believed himself to be legendary, even saying in one video that he always had a big ego, was a perfectionist, and dreamed big. Randy thought he deserved to be remembered. His attack and his philosophy would be notorious, studied for generations. He envied people who were successful and who were able to find romantic partners. Randy lacked empathy for other people. He hated people in society. He wanted to cause as much destruction as possible. So kind of putting everything together, here's my theory about what happened in this case. I think that Randy wanted to present himself as an anti-hero, a tragic figure who would go on to greatness after death. In reality, he was a troubled young man who killed three people for no reason. He brought tremendous pain into the world. Isolated socially from a young age due to depression, social anxiety, and awkwardness, Randy became lost in a fantasy world he created. In the absence of real friends, he developed imaginary ones. But he could not shake the desire to get revenge on society for what he perceived as their wrongdoing. I find it interesting that he said he hated all people, but he thanked his fans. Clearly, he liked people who liked him. Much of what happened with Randy was probably about rejection. He tried to make it seem as though he was strong. Everything was going according to plan. He was actually great. He didn't need people. He didn't care. But that wasn't true. He was confused and hurting tremendously. One of the reasons this case has attracted so much attention, in addition to all the content that he produced, is the gender dysphoria angle. Those symptoms may have explained some of his pain, but they don't explain the homicides. Homicidal behavior is facilitated by a lack of empathy, coldness, arrogance, a sense of entitlement, vindictiveness, sadism, anger, and aggression. Those characteristics existed in Randy separate of anything to do with gender dysphoria. He had the potential to be homicidal regardless of what type of pain he experienced in his life. I think the real story with Randy Stare is how a person developed hatred for people over time. He desperately wanted to be loved. He wanted attention. He wanted people to respect him, to recognize his talent, but he was unable to achieve that goal. In addition, he never received the appropriate mental health care. Those are my thoughts on Randy Stare. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.